Well, thank you for helping me get the technology working. And um, a big hello to all of you that have joined us for the session and welcome to the Advancements in Emerging Technology Breakout Session. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, those of you that are familiar with these um, technical committees that we have for these afternoon sessions, we'll know that the emerging technology session is probably one of the more technical sessions. We try to have um, one more technical session on Wednesday and another on Thursday. Uh, but that said, we always welcome new ideas. If there's something you'd really like to hear about in the session, please don't hesitate to drop an email um, and let us know about a particular topic that you're interested in learning about. Um, I'm not going to take up any more of your time today. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but you guys are in excellent hands today with Jenny Borman. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to her and, and she will chair the rest of the session. And thank you all again for being there. Okay, thanks, Megan. We're going to kick off with Dr. Randy Culbertson from IGS. Uh, Randy got her uh, graduate degrees at CSU in their breeding and genetics group. And so we're excited to hear today about the multi-breed evaluation that IGS is running and, and how that can work for producers. So welcome, Randy. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So like she said, I am the uh, lead geneticist for IGS, which is a multi-breed genetic evaluation. And today I'm going to talk about, uh, give a little background about what IGS is, the evaluation, the traits we run, and you know, talk a little bit about how this works for seed stock and commercial producers. So to start off with, what is IGS? So IGS, like I said, is a multi-breed genetic evaluation. We have 17 partners. And the real unique thing about IGS is the collaboration that we have with our partners. It's a collaboration between breed associations to really work on and who are really committed to enhancing commercial profitability. And this breaks apart from the traditional breed association model, which kind of had a sort of an isolationist, you know, way of operating. So breed associations traditionally were very focused on their own breed and how to within themselves work together or to work to improve their breed. But with IGS, we work on collaboration. So all the breed associations submitting all of their data, their pedigree information, and using all that data in collaboration to improve genetic prediction and accuracy of our multi-breed evaluation. So currently, this, our evaluation is publishing over 20 million EPDs, and we are incorporating over 300,000 genotypes. So on the slide, I have 340,000. I think as of this week, we're um, just over 350,000 genotypes in the evaluation that we're incorporating. So our evaluation, it's a weekly evaluation. We publish EPDs every week. Uh, the traits that we include in our evaluation, we have um, our weight traits, so birth, weaning weight, yearling weight. We include milk in that evaluation, which is maternal weaning weight. Uh, we have a stayability EPD, which is defined as the, um, the probability of a sire's daughter remaining in the herd till she reaches the age of six. We have a docility EPD, calving ease, which is direct and maternal. We also publish EPDs for carcass traits. So that's gonna be carcass weight, marbling, ribeye, back fat, and yield grade. We do incorporate ultrasound records into that carcass evaluation. It's a multi-trait evaluation. We do publish a PAP EPD. That's only published once or twice a year. And that's actually um, an evaluation that's run at Colorado State University. Um, but it does use IGS data and par partner uh, records that go into that evaluation. We do incorporate genomics. We use a super hybrid model and we incorporate genomics in all the traits except for our maternal traits and PAP. It is kind of on our R&D list to hopefully eventually incorporate some genomics into PAP or at least start to explore that, but we are still lacking the number of records that we would need to do that. But currently we use the super hybrid model in all traits, but maternal for our weekly evaluation. 
So why IGS? Why, why the collaboration and why would breed associations kind of break away from that traditional model to want to work with IGS? So in this graph, it's the number of records that are submitted by animal birth year from 2000 on by all the individual breed associations that are included into IGS. And you can see here that, you know, most of the records are gonna be less than 50,000 submitted per year. We have a couple of breed associations that are submitting a little bit more, but most of the breed associations we're going to be, you know, we're under 100,000 records, give or take, that are submitted on an annual basis. When we take all of these breed associations and put them into IGS, we see that, that there is a huge jump in the number of records that are being submitted annually into IGS. And when you think about that as far as improving prediction for a genetic evaluation and improving the whole evaluation and all that prediction and genetic tools that we can provide to producers, these number of records and including all this information is huge. The other aspect that I think is probably an even bigger advantage for IGS, so we have all this information coming through, but it's also the number of connectivity and the number of records that we have in multiple databases that can be linked up to sires. So if we think about just a breed association on its own, so let's say Red Angus, for example, they have a bull and they have a certain number of calves that are registered within Red Angus. But when that bull, when that association joins IGS, we then see that there's an increase of the number of progeny because suddenly we don't have just progeny in Red Angus, we now have progeny in multiple databases. And in actuality with IGS, it's something more like this. It's not just one or two databases, we have progeny in multiple databases. And this really increases, is a huge increase for these bulls that are used across databases. And this increase in accuracy is, has kind of a ripple effect throughout the pedigree. It's not only gonna improve accuracy for this bull, it's gonna improve accuracy for all of his relatives as well. So let's use Red Angus as an example. The number of Red Angus sires with progeny in multiple databases is roughly 7,000 or 7,000 sires, excuse me. If we look at the total number of progeny from these 7,000 sires, it's a little over 2 million animals. So these are high use sires that are used throughout IGS, throughout our IGS database. The number of progeny from these sires that are in non-red Angus, that are non-red Angus progeny is 1.3 million. If we look at how many of those are red Angus progeny or registered with red Angus, it's, a, it's over 600,000. So that's a threefold increase in the number of progeny from these bulls by being part of IGS because we have these multiple databases and the sharing of information. But let's, let's look at a smaller breed association. So Canadian Gelby, I'm picking on Canadians because they're stuck north across the border. Um, but if we look at Canadian um, Gelby Association, they have about 700 bulls that have progeny in multiple databases. The total number of progeny from these bulls is over 400,000, so 425,000 approximately. The number of those progeny that are in other databases outside of Canadian Gelby is 390,000. The number of their progeny that are in their database is 30,000. So for these 7, 000, or 700 bulls, being part of IGS is increasing the number of progeny for these bull, bulls 13 fold. So for these smaller breed associations, they're getting a huge increase in accuracy by being part of IGS because of that connectivity with the pedigree and the use of multiple databases and data coming from all of these, all of our partners. So this, and this increase in accuracy, especially for these smaller associations can really help for the prediction and the genetic prediction of these bulls. Now there are 
several challenges with having a multi-breed genetic evaluation. So the first one is data collection and how do we take all the information from multiple different databases and put it into one evaluation? So we have a computer programmer, Jordan Bowman, who does an excellent job. Should I just hit later? So uh, Jordan Bowman's our databaser and our uh, computer programmer, and he handles a lot of this information coming in from multiple databases. And we do a lot of interfacing with the databasing from um, the breed associations that we work with. And so it's a lot of work of making sure that the formatting for this data is correct coming into the evaluation. The other issue that we do, we are always working and trying to solve is multiple registrations. We have animals that are, that are registered in multiple databases. And in most cases, we can identify those animals. They get one ID, so they're only, you know, so they are going into the evaluation with the ID that we assign them. But there are occasions where we will have animals registered in multiple databases. And until somebody points it out, we can't identify those. So as soon as somebody points it out, and as soon as we can figure out, a, we kind of identify those animals, we fix that problem. We do have checks in um, our system that says, you know, if an animal's got a same sire and dam, they have the same birth date, they have very similar, you know, their birth weight records are the same in multiple databases. It's pretty reasonable to think that that is the same animal, especially if they are not an ET calf. So that's how we resolve a lot of those issues. But this is an ongoing problem that we are always working with to um, sort out those multiple registration problems. The other issue is it is a multi-breed genetic evaluation. So how do we handle breed differences? In our case, we use genetic groups or Westel groups. The exception to this is our carcass evaluation. You know, the carcass evaluation on any beef cattle operate or any beef cattle evaluation is always kind of the weak spot. We really struggle at getting phenotypes into the carcass evaluation. And I think that's pretty, you know, it's a pretty common problem in the industry. And because of that, the kind of lack of phenotypes, we also found with the development of that evaluation that there was a lack of connectivity with those phenotypes. So that um, the lack of that connectivity and, you know, once the evaluation, the test runs were run, it just wasn't really doing a great job of handling the Westall groups, wasn't really getting to those breed differences. So in the carcass evaluation, we actually make an adjustment at the end of the evaluation using meat animal research carcass adjustments or breed differences for carcass. We also do make an adjustment for heterosis for the evaluation. And like I said, we do incorporate marker effects into the evaluation. And the, we use a marker subset and uh, Dr. Mati Sachi has done the majority of the work for this. And he has uh, gone through and identified markers that are common across all breeds. And those are the marker subsets that we incorporate into the evaluation. Another challenge that we have is the introduction of new partners coming into the evaluation. So as we have a, a breed association approach us, say they wanna be part of the evaluation, we go through a process we call beta testing. So the first thing we do is we, um, we work on uploading their data into our database. There's almost always errors that have to get sorted out, get the formatting right. Once we get that information into our database, we have what we call our production run, which is our weekly evaluation. We take the information that goes into that weekly evaluation and on a separate machine, we run what we call the beta test. And this is our production information, including the new or potential partner. And we make, a, we kind of in tandem with production, run another evaluation, including this new information. The end of that, we look at, we have several quality control checks at the end of the evaluation. We're gonna to look to see how incorporating this new information is gonna affect our current partners in the evaluation. And also look to see if the, the EPD is coming out for the new partner. Does everything make sense? Is this, you know, 
are we expecting animal the evaluation is it handling this new information correct correctly we then take those new epds for the potential partner send it back to those partners and we ask them to go through look through it does it make sense to them if there's anything that doesn't make sense that's when we dive in we look at it you know we make sure that we don't have that we have the pedigree ties that we're expecting and you know and the big thing too is seeing how it's going to affect those new our existing partners if we see that there's going to be changes you know, we want to give our partners a heads up, let them know that could, there could be some potential changes, and we investigate it to make sure that it is reasonable given this new data. The other thing that's important to keep in mind that we, a question that we get quite commonly when we have um, breed associations asking about joining IGS is how is their breed association, how is their breed going to compare to other breeds? And that's not what we are looking at in the evaluation. You know, we, we will look to make sure that the breed differences make sense, but we're not comparing the associations to other associations. Those EPDs are released back to the association and we're not doing any ranking across IGS. So percentile ranks are done within each breed association and we are not making those comparisons to from breed association to breed association. So that's great. Just talked about why IGS and what our evaluation is. So that does nothing to answer the question that I came here to talk about, which is how does this work for seed stock and commercial producers? And to be honest, when I was putting this talk together, I kind of struggled with these two aspects because to me, it seems pretty obvious why it would work. It's a multi-breed evaluation. And we've got, we are bringing in so much information and all that connectivity with the pedigree that really just helps us to increase prediction and accuracy of our evaluation. So very first line is increased information, it's gonna increase accuracy. That connectivity through the pedigree is really going to increase the accuracy of animals and our prediction. And especially for the smaller breed associations that just don't have those numbers, this increase in those pedigree ties and the increase of information can really help provide better prediction for those smaller breed associations. And also that gives them better EPDs with more accuracy for their members to market their animals. An important thing with IGS EPDs is they are comparable across partners. A red Angus EPD is directly comparable to a Simmental EPD that's directly comparable to Gelvy and Limousine. So there's not, you don't need to go through and make an adjustment when looking at those EPDs. So for um, seed stock producers trying to market and sell cattle, especially for producers who are maybe selling multiple or different breeds of cattle, it's easier for them to just you know, have the EPD out, EPDs out there where there's, you don't have to convert those two EPDs. The other thing too, is we have more data on related animals. It goes back to those, it, those, those ties across pedigrees and across databases. Because we're incorporating that, it just improves the genetic prediction and can help with younger sires and help with those high use AI bulls because you're gonna have a pretty big jump in accuracy when, you incorp when you're incorporated into IGS. The other thing too is when, if you are marketing composites, those IGS, we handle those breed differences. And again, you don't have to make an adjustment for EPDs. So fine, and you know, this gives, IGS EPDs are very marketable for seed stock producers, especially for those who are looking to market to the commercial producer. So what about on the commercial side? A lot of the same reasons that it was advantageous for seed stock producers, it's advantageous for the commercial producer. Increased information, increased accuracy, and it's across breeds. The commercial producer is looking at comparing a red Angus bull at one sale and is also going to look at a Gelvy bull at another sale. He can directly compare those EPDs. 
The other thing is that we're more inclined to get information, especially carcass information from commercial producers. And that is huge for our evaluation because we are trying to incorporate more carcass phenotypes just to really increase the prediction that we are providing through our carcass evaluation. We have a feeder profit calculator, which is a tool for um, marketing, marketing tool for commercial producers. It uses IGS EPDs to predict feedlot performance for feeder cattle. And the big thing with IGS is that it's really leveraging the data across all breed associations and using that leverage to really increase the prediction of our EPDs and our accuracy. Prior to IGS, for commercial producers, there weren't a lot of genetic tools that a commercial producer could use to improve their herd. So they could go out and buy a bull and they probably have a pretty good idea of what that bull's genetic merit is based on that bull's EPDs. But if they have a cow herd, how do they get EPDs on that cow herd? There's several avenues through many of our IGS partners where commercial producers can register their cow herd with those partners and be able to leverage that information and start to get more genetic tools on their overall cow herd. Now we do have, there are genomic tools that commercial producers can use, but when you think about an EPD, an EPD is going to be looking at kind of a wider picture than what you'll get with the genetic tools. So an EPD, you know, for traits like weaning weight and birth weight, it's polygenic. So you can just get kind of a bigger picture and it's just one more tool that pro commercial producers can use to improve their herd. So with that, I will uh, take any questions. So some of our partners, if, oh yeah. So the question is, as we incorporate all the information across these different breed associations, how do we handle traits that are not commonly measured across breed associations, or maybe even a trait that we are not publishing. And um, so for traits that we are not publishing, some of our partners do, um, do a few evaluations outside of what IGS is doing. So, um, and they'll work with um, universities for publishing that. So for example, CSU publishes um, a, dry matter, a dry matter intake EPD for red Angus um, and does some other um, evaluations for Gelvy as well. Now that said, we are in the process of um, working on getting some more um, EPDs out. So right now our high priority is getting dry matter intake, heifer pregnancy and mature weight to be included into IGS. Um, so, you know, we have regular meetings with our partners and there are discussions if we feel like it's a trait that can, we can get enough records on, it's, you know, it goes on the list and we start working in how to, you know, develop those EPDs and start to incorporate them. Um, we have been doing, well, Lane Geis has been doing the bulk of the work for feet and leg. Um, the big challenge there is we just don't have enough phenotypic records. So we, we do have to kind of get to that threshold point where we get enough records in to start really working on getting that to an EPD that we can publish. So the question is, are we assuming, that the, are we using a common variance across breeds? So we are just using a common variance across breeds. We do account for those breed differences, like I said, using genetic groups. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, you know, so I said there's a, so the EPDs, IGS EPDs are comparable. The question is, is that what the breed associations are publishing? And it is, yes. Right. Uh, so the question is the across breed adjustments, um, why are those different when we have IGS EPDs that are directly comparable? That is a great question. Um, so we have had conversations with uh, Meat, Meat Animal Research Center. So they develop those across breed um, EPD adjustments. And we've had conversations because, you know, before IGS, every breed association was generating their own EPDs. So you needed that adjustment because they were each individual evaluations. But now with IGS, it's just one big evaluation incorporating all that information. 
So it has been a question. Um, so, you know, Mark, those numbers are correct for, for Mark, but now with the application of IGS, you do, if it's an IGS EPD with an IGS partner, you would not need to use that across breed adjustment. You just can compare those EPDs. If it is a partner outside of IGS, like let's say you're gonna look at an Angus bull, um, we do have an adjustment for that if you wanted to make that comparison and we just, you know, you can just shoot us an email and we can talk to you about that adjustment. Um, like I said, we, we only have an adjustment to an Angus bull. So if you were gonna, let's say, look at a Charlet bull, we would say, you know, make the adjustment and then use the across breed table for that. Um, we've got a pretty good, we've got a sizable amount of data in our evaluation. We feel pretty confident in our adjustment. Um, but like I said, that is something that we are trying to, um, it, it's a big question we're trying to tackle. We don't have a great answer yet, but we are, Taking, taking those steps towards trying to get a better resolution for that. We have some boss indicus in the evaluation. It is, um, it's, not, it's not the bulk of what we have in the evaluation, because as you can see with our partners, but you know, for example, for Simmental, we have Simbra cattle in there. So we do have some boss indicus at cattle in the evaluation, we would of course like to, as you know, as a genetics nerd, I would love to see more eared cattle in the evaluation. Um, but yes, we do have some Brahmin influence cattle.